to the talk we're for here. I mean, you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to Naoto Hiera. Um, he will has the nice talk title, Algorithm Diversion. And when I read the abstract, I was really like, okay, this sounds interesting. It's something about neurodiversity and digital art, but I don't try to explain whatever this is about because this is his job. And so please welcome him with a big round of applause. Naruto, stage is yours. Good evening. Um, my name is Naoto Hieda. Uh, my ti uh, talk's title is Algorithm Diversion. And um, this is the outline. No, I usually don't start with the outline. In fact, my slides are made with my own program on processing. And this is an actual part of the code snippet. So it might crash. Or it might behave weird, because I haven't tried with this resolution, but uh, this is part of the performance or presentation. Um, and I hope that this is a safe space, of course, but I just say it over and over, because then if I say it, then it's safe now. That I, I'm, I'm sure nobody's going to attack anyone else. Um, based on race or gender or whatever, but just to say it. Because it's about myself and, um, yeah, it's always needs some, a bit of courage to talk about myself. Oh, uh, this is actually uh, part of the, my code. It's uh, called Lawrence Attractor. Um, it's stuck over there, but Basically, it's um, particle behavior based on a few equations. And although it's set equations because of some um, uh, how computer calculates, it won't converge and it makes this amazing shape. Or sometimes it's stuck at the top. Um, I'm starting my talk with talking about autism because I'm on the autism spectrum, and um, how I work with art is uh, heavily related to the fact of my neurodiversity. Um, this is a picture I took from Wikipedia, and the t uh, caption is, a young boy with autism who has arranged his toys in a row, which I really love. Um, just this text is amazing to me. And uh, how he arranged it is amazing, and he's sleeping like like everything is amazing in this photo. I think. Um, I don't know what you know about autism spectrum. Um, you might think people who are not good at communication, who are good at math, but sometimes not. Um, that's probably the idea. Um, I think it's partly true, but also it's not always true. And um, I found it's interesting to like work on like being autism uh, or high functioning autism or whatever uh, and uh, work with art because sometimes people think that we don't have emotions or yeah, so it's not like because art is about emotions, like triggering others' emotions, like autistic people cannot do, cannot make good art. Um, which is, sounds a bit logical, but it's not logical at all because, first of all, art is not really about emotions. Um, sometimes it's just shapes. Um, sometimes it's really irritating. And um, also, we do have emotions. It's just that um, we lack cognitive uh, empathy so that we have difficulty uh, expressing our emotions. So, like, right now, I don't know if I'm happy to be here, or I'm sad to be here, or I'm nervous, or I'm relaxed. Um, I mean, people just, you know, like, you can just say it. I can just say I'm happy to be here, to be invited. But also, at the same time, then I start thinking, uh, but I kind of regret that I accepted this inv invitation. Or, like, I'm so nervous, but also I like to be on the stage to perform, so that makes it a bit uh, relaxing. So, like, this, is, this weird thing is 
I think it really um, descri describes uh, how autism is. And I knew about it when I was taking a dance workshop um, by choreographer Maria Hassabi and um, gallerist Jan Mott. They had this week-long uh, workshop, it's a dance workshop, we were doing like, really weird stuff, like walking, like 20 of us walking in a street, like super slow, and then we write about how we felt. And that was the key, like we ha always had to have a notebook, and we have to write from my own perspective how I felt this um, experience. Uh, which was really hard for me because I always observe shapes, numbers, or patterns, but it's hard to, for me to say it was comfortable or uncomfortable, what I learned, even that's like so hard. Like I can say at 2.50 I started walking, and then I, at 2.45 no, I stopped walking. Or like these exact things with numbers, it's really easy for me. In fact, in my diary, I have all these numbers of, uh, not the numbers, uh, yeah, the numbers of uh, the time when I arrived at a specific place. And this has been my habit for the last seven years. Um, so yes, I was talking about autism. And then, yes, the notebook, uh, uh, it was really hard for me to write from my uh, own perspective. And uh, I look at, at someone else's notebook, and he was really good at making like, uh, it's, it's even not his perspective, but it's like persona he made up because he's an actor and he's really good at thinking about like this first person perspective and how he felt through this person and which was like totally not possible to, uh, for me to do it. And then I started to think that I'm something wrong with my writing or perception. And then, uh, interestingly, after that workshop, I started working in a neuroscience institution. And then uh, people told me about uh, autism. And then I Googled it more and more. And then I found that I'm on the spectrum. But I don't have a, a proper diagnosis. So I cannot actually, I shouldn't actually publi publicly say it. But then uh, what's the benefit of having a diagnosis that doesn't really benefit myself because I don't really get like a health insurance or whatever, like a, um, yeah, like a support from the government because there are quite a lot of uh, high functioning autism people. And uh, for low functioning autism people, there are uh, support, but uh, for us it's, uh, yeah, like because we can talk like other people, it's a bit weird, but we can talk, we can live by ourselves. So they think that our, we are normal, but anyways, um, so anyways, we, I have my problem with my brain, and this is actually a photo of my brain, um, which is uh, partly, uh, it's half true and half false, because you cannot really take a photo of a brain unless you open my skull. Uh, this is, uh, well, actually, I took an MRI, MRI of my brain, and I 3D printed it. Um, I was really fortunate that I got the data, and I 3D printed, and uh, this is a photo of my 3D printed brain. And I started working on uh, tapestry work, which is uh, actually based on the pattern of my brain. Um, I just I want to talk about the tapestry or a textile because it has quite a lot uh, to do with the computation. If you look at the history, the punch card of the programming uh, came from the jacquard uh, loom. Uh, these punch cards, the patterns and then they, it became Fortran or whatever uh, programming language as a uh, punch card. But um, this history is really interesting, but for me it's more interesting to look at how we can translate uh, one knowledge to another from like more, uh, not just a surface, like we, I don't say the punch card is only the surface of these two, um, this connection of these two things, but there must be something more, like something deeper between uh, computation and, for example, tapestry, or I talk about other things, but... Uh, so this is a program I wrote to generate a uh, tapestry pattern uh, based on um, computer vision, some kind of anal analysis of my brain shape, and uh, I made this uh, automatically 
generate these patterns, and I did uh, weaving by hand. It took like a month to do it, and um, this is not really finished yet. I mean, this one thing is finished, but I want to continue working on it and um, think about what's possible, like how I can translate the knowledge from computer programming, for example, to uh, weaving or vice versa. The other thing, uh, well, there are quite a lot of things that uh, around programming I'm interested in, like merging together. And one thing is movement. I like to be on a stage, um, like now, uh, and uh, I like to dance. And if you look at the history, there's also something with dance and um, let's say notation, not so much of a programming, but notation that builds the, for example, an algorithm. Uh, this is uh, Laban notation, uh, made in like 1920s. And basically what he did is, I always find this figure really funny, um, but uh, basically the idea is he uh, assigned different symbols to each part of the body. By the way, this is from Wikipedia. Um, and um, so each part of the body has different symbols, and based on the height or directions, uh, you can add some colors or like different filling, and then uh, you can describe the position or the direction of the movement. And with this, uh, like it's like a musical notation, like uh, in the time uh, domain, you can have more notations and describe a dance movement or dance piece. But the idea is not to describe like a ballet movement, for example. It's just a, one way of looking at the movement. And also uh, people, I, I haven't learned this notation, but people learned uh, this notation can look at this score and do the movement, which is really interesting because it's not really about archiving the, the dance movement, but transforming the dance movement to something else. And you can potentially um, do some kind of, uh, op um, like run some kind of algorithm to morph it and uh, play it again. Or like this gives like so many possibilities, but I think so many things have been done by uh, John Cage and these uh, amazing artists. So I wouldn't really propose something new here. The other relationship between movement and um, computation or geometry is, um, for example, Oskar Schlemmer. I think um, artists here, they are really tired of this uh, Bauhaus thing this year. But uh, um, yeah, I had a project uh, supported by uh, this part in the frame of Bauhaus and uh, uh, Goethe Institute and Bloomberg to work with uh, choreographer uh, Raphael Hillebrand and dancers from Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts to create a 21st century version of Oscar Schlemmer. And I can, I have a video. So basically, there's a uh, video camera which actually shows, uh, it's actually shown here, uh, is tracking, uh, well, capturing the dancers and we're using an uh, algorithm or the library called OpenPose to track uh, 10 dancers and visualizing it on the screen. And um, it's funny that uh, like Shulemar did the same thing without technology or technology, like analog technology, sticking these uh, sticks on the body. Uh, but we did a really complex computation to track bodies and showing it here, which is not even like augmented, which is like on a flat screen and uh, you can see a bit delayed uh, bodies moving in the screen with the lines. Okay. So that was like my interest with um, 
first one is tapestry, the second one was movement, and then, uh, but also like I'm really interested in just these lines, like Schlemmer was interested back then on a the stage, but I'm interested with the pixels or screens and how to show um, or choreograph these uh, dots and lines. But this itself is not actually a new thing. Like in like 21st century, we can download uh, these uh, amazing tools for computer graphics and uh, make these things happen. But uh, back in 1982, there was this program called 10Print, which is uh, just one line of code in basic. 10 uh, is the address and print character uh, at the address of uh, 205.5 plus random which becomes either forward slash or backslash and go to 10, which is like a classical uh, go-to loop. And if you run it, it shows forward slashes and backslashes just in a random sequence. And after a while, you can see interesting patterns show up. Well, this is a recreated version uh, with processing. This is the processing. Um, I use the processing uh, to create these slides, and I use this to make videos, or uh, the video that I showed with the 21st century of stick dance, I used the processing to make it. Processing is made by um, Ben Fry and Casey Rice in 2001. And the idea of processing is to make coding easy. For example, if you want to show a triangle on a screen with OpenGL, like C language, you have to write all these lines, and this is just a part of the code, just to show a triangle. But it makes more sense to have a draw function and have triangle function. So this was like a revolutionary thing with processing, that you don't have to think about this crazy um, things about OpenGL, and you can just have triangle, ellipse, circle, rectangle to draw shapes, which actually shows a triangle with the same code. And I started drawing things like grids or, um, yeah, like particles to make a star field. I'm really obsessed with sine waves and more sine waves. Um, and also, I'm interested in using the code with other modalities, like I showed the movement. But um, for example, like text. And oh, sorry, this was a different slide. Um, no, uh, OK, I was doing this experiment to have a um, little bit of meditation every day and think about the shape in myself. And I was drawing shapes with handwriting or processing. And at the same time, I was doing some movement exercises, which is kind of funny to look at it um, now, because I was just recording whatever movements uh, back then. And um, it was not really made for showing to other people. So it's really funny to see some screenshots from these movements. But the, these movements were like uh, meant to describe the same shape as I drew in processing or with the handwriting, hand drawing. And, uh, and then I was also interested in text or poem. And how I see poem is not always based on text, but often it's based on, like, it evokes like shapes uh, or patterns, colors. So I started to like draw shapes that was evoked. And this is why I started this is because um, there was an interesting workshop about uh, machine learning where we were asked to categorize different poems. And it was really hard. Like you can just categorize them based on the style or I don't know, whatever emotion it triggers. But uh, I decided to first convert them to a shape, and then based on these shapes, I can easily categorize them 
Is it a circle or is it more square or triangle? And for example, this shape is more like a rectangle or like more like a grid. Um, the other ones are like a sh more like 3D shapes. I also collaborated with a uh, writer or dancer, uh, Janine Harrington, to make um, this kind of interactive videos with text. Okay, so it was like a going to like different directions, but now I want to a bit, go back a bit to the diversity part uh, about programming. Uh, this is P5JS, which is a spin-off of processing. And uh, it's started by Lauren McCarthy in 2012. And the idea is to make um, processing-like uh, creative coding environment, but on the web. Because processing, you, have to, you still have to, it's really easy to use, but you still have to download the program processing IDE, and then you have to uh, use that one. And you cannot uh, easily share your program unless you take like, a screenshot or uh, yeah, a screen recording of the video to put it on Instagram, for example. But uh, if it's on the web, you can just send a link, and then everyone can see it. Or you can either uh, use platforms like open processing, where it, you can just start writing your code with P5JS, and it's going to show up in a gallery. And people like each other's sketches, and uh, even people uh, fork your sketch to make something new based on your sketch. What is interesting about P5JS is uh, its community. Um, I'm going to read it. It's a bit long, but uh, I mean, it's not long text, but in, this is the longest text in my slide. Uh, P5JS community statement. P5JS is a community interested in exploring the creation of art and design with technology. We are a community of and in solidarity with people with, from every gender, identity, and expression, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, language, neurotype, size, ability, class, religion, culture, subculture, political opinion, age, skill level, occupation, and background. We acknowledge that not everyone has uh, time, financial means, or capacity to actively participate, but we recognize and encourage involvement of all kinds. We facilitate and foster access and empowerment. We are all learners. We like these hashtags, no code snobs, because we value community over efficiency. New kid love. Because we all started somewhere. An assumed core. Because we don't assume knowledge. And Black Lives Matter. Because of course. So this is like a um, different direction, a bit different direction from processing. Because processing was still uh, like lowering the uh, barrier to start coding for everyone. But still, it was more. Um, yeah, like a white man dominated uh, me based on this media art, old media art culture. But P5JS is explicitly breaking this thing and uh, assuming that everyone is a learner. And for example, if you ask questions on GitHub, like this doesn't work, usually in a, um, most of the projects, they will like, just close your uh, issue and they say, you know, just look at the document. But P5JS, is quite different, has a different approach. For example, if they, pe people ask something on the issue, then they think that that means the documentation is not good enough, or they have to point them to the proper documentation and don't just kick them out. And that's the inclusion, and, which I like about P5JS. And quite different from the past examples with lines and Dots, uh, I really like this uh, example from Processing Community Day, Basil, made with um, P5JS, which I have this, uh, well, if you go to the, their website, you can see the uh, real-time version. And it's just a particle system. It's the same, as doing, same thing as uh, doing dots and lines, but it shows the uh, emojis of different people, and this really makes... Um, Different, like I, I really think that the examples in processing and example in P5JS is quite different in this aspect. 
And um, I said processing community, community day Basel, but what is processing community day? Uh, it started in 2017. Um, processing has quite long um, history as a programming language, but actually they only started like an official meetup in 2017. And that was the first processing community day in Boston. And this year they started a worldwide movement so that um, people in different communities, they host their own uh, chapter of community, processing community day. And the nice thing is uh, written here for in the PCD organizers kit. Uh, PCD is a day, blah, 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 to celebrate art, code, and diversity around the world. So it's not only about celebrating art and code, but it's about art, code, and diversity. So I was really interested in doing PCD, bringing that in Tokyo, because I, was, uh, I participated in Boston, and then I really thought that we have to do this in Japan, because I'm from Japan. And at that time, I was not living in Japan, but I felt that I have to go there, and I have to organize this thing. And uh, in February, uh, last February, uh, it happened. Uh, um, the, there were three organizers. Uh, Yasto and uh, Ayumu and myself, and uh, we had nearly 150 um, people coming to the, the event. We had keynotes, we had workshop. This one, I particularly, particularly like it because uh, it's hard to see it in the screen, but uh, it was a workshop, introductory, introductory workshop in P5.js to draw flower patterns, which is really colorful. And also, we had interesting lightning talks. For example, this one was about uh, teaching uh, grade uh, four kids to write processing. And it is difficult, not just because of learning programming, but they don't know how to type to begin with. So he explained us like a different ways for them to type. Uh, actually, he doesn't really introduce how to um, code like interactive programs, but just to start with these line commands or triangle commands so that you can draw something like a static image on the canvas, and then you can go to uh, more compl complex examples. And we'll have a PCD Tokyo 2020 uh, next uh, February. First, so if you happen to be in Japan, please check this out. And this cover uh, image, we just made it uh, with uh, amazing artist uh, Reona. She did uh, these square, uh, like this wave texture thing in the square. And uh, Takao, he did uh, tiling. And uh, Chinyuri, she did uh, yeah, the post uh, editing of this thing to, with the logo. So it's really like a collaborative thing, and it's not like um, there's a guru in processing and everyone follows that person, but it's more about making a community and um, yeah, working together and finding something new. And also, I don't have a slide for this, but uh, I organize a weekly meetup in Cologne right now, uh, Creative Code Cologne, or, but the acronym uh, is not good, so we call it Creative Code Cologne, so CCK, uh, every Thursday. Um, so if you are in the area, please check that out. And in this uh, PCD 2020, we will have a new session for live coding. Live coding is, uh, can be interpreted in different ways, but for us, it's a uh, performance to be on the stage and write program and perform at the same time. And uh, for example, this is a photo of Cody. I think they are based in New York City. And they make uh, visuals and sound uh, together at the same time with manipulating the code on the stage. And this is really also interesting uh, community, this uh, live coding because it's still really a small community and it's really wide uh, spread uh, across the world and there's no like uh, hub right now and which makes people, everyone, all the artists really nomad and 
they know each other, they respect each other, and uh, that makes really diverse community, which I really like. And I think I still have quite a lot of time, and I want to introduce you my website. Um, this is an archive of sketches I'm making, and recently I started to write about Hydra. It's an online book. Well, book. I mean, I just started as an article. Um, Hydra is a live coding environment, uh, web-based, and you can make visuals really quickly. And if you open Hydra interface, you can start with the example. It shows up with the example, and then also you can just start from scratch. Simple oscillator, and you can add modulation, and you can chain them, and it goes crazier and crazier. And this is really nice because I just I'm just now live coding and performing, and um, it's, it's really nice to do it on the fly, and it goes like crazy and crazier. But because I'm interested in algorithm, I started to think about how to make this more systematic, like not just uh, randomly like finding crazy patterns, but how can I make more like a theoretical um, understanding of this language because this is really interesting. And by the way, Hydra is made by Olivia Jack. She's a really amazing uh, artist from Colombia. Sometimes she's in Berlin, so um, you might uh, happen to meet her. Okay, so the idea of this book is to start with basic textures and discuss like different filters and how to make it um, like a systematic way or like understanding what is actually happening in the code or, or like how is it these code interpreted and why sometimes thing doesn't work sometimes things work like why like the, this is my interest like my interest is often not about making pretty visuals um, which is maybe not which, which might be the reason why I'm not the great artist, that I'm not really focusing on the, the, the appearance, but I'm more interested in what is happening behind. But it's interesting to think about, for example, like if you start with um, square, oops, um, yeah, it's okay. Um, you can repeat the pattern, and you can layer them with a bit of offset. Uh, I actually don't know. You can make these um, patterns. And then what I proposed in my book is extending this idea to make a um, RGB pixel-like pattern and also chaining this with another oscillator to make it uh, really look like a um, low-resolution RGB LCD. Just paste it and run it. It works. I can add some animations. Uh, adding here. So it's like also like a cookbook that you can just take these snippets and modify it. I try to explain what's behind Hydra, but um, yeah, if you're interested, please look at this online book. And I also have um, some sketches that are, uh, maybe not this one, uh, maybe this one. This is made with P5.js, and uh, I took a code from uh, P code, which is made by 
uh, Akira Kubota and uh, Yosuke Hayashi. And uh, basically, this little line of code is evaluated into uh, musical notes, which is kind of like really like an old synthesizer. But I added like um, P5JS uh, reactive visual, and you can also this. Uh, yeah, you can do live code with this as well. It sounds really broken, but it's actually working properly. I mean, this is also a fun part of live code because it's not always about success. Like, you get like some weird results, and that might uh, lead to a new like discovery. But uh, in this case of Hydra, I was like uh, writing this online book to compensate this uh, trial and error part uh, by analyzing uh, it. And I think both has to happen at the same time. Like sometimes you need to really analyze it, but sometimes you just have to give it a try and see how it goes. Uh, okay, so uh, next I want to go to another version of Hydra, which is also made by Olivia. Um, it's called Pixel Jam. It's really amazing. I hope it runs here because it needs online uh, connection. Um, it's starting. Basically, Pixel Jam is a collaborative live coding environment, uh, online live coding environment. You can add more things. But basically, if you, it's like a, basically, it's like a chat. You type your name and um, I asked people to join around this time, but no one's here. Uh, yeah, I should say hello from... So basically the idea is someone uh, modifies the buffer here, and then someone else edits here. Um, I don't know what would be interesting. I can add colors or, oh, there's someone. What? I don't know these guys, but uh, yeah, they just came at the right time. That's great. Um, yeah, I don't know like how to continue this talk because I was thinking about just starting to live code and um, like it's, I think it's really interesting to live code and talk about it. Oh, there's someone. That's great. Uh, well, it's quite a lot of people. So maybe I can just uh, let them play and I can talk uh, through. <laughs> I mean, this is really an amazing idea because live coding on the stage is already really amazing because you see people coding and it's like, in a way, it's more like intimate because you get the, um, you know, the process and it's... Uh, you just see like what's happening behind, and this is like so amazing because you can just like you don't have to go to the the live coding performance. You just have to sit on a couch at home, and then you can code with others, and it becomes like really amazing uh, performance. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I like this idea. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Probably some of you is doing this, um, but you can just. Uh, yeah, modify. Um, the code and you can play with it. You can just add layer. And again, like shout out to uh, Olivia Jack because she made this and she's maintaining all these things. She's just amazing. Yeah. Um, but this is not really crazy yet. Oh, oh no. <laughs> but they, they're not like new people, right? They know how to do it. Like, if you don't know the syntax, it's like so hard to write. Like, okay, now I'm really, um, this is actually like, okay, I, I think this is really amazing uh, performance or uh, talk because like, now I don't know what's happening, but it's just like, Amazing. 
but that's something I wrote before. I think someone took from the history and uh, wrote it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, is it possible to like do the Q and questions and this like simultaneously, or is it like so distracting? Or like, I just like to be like freestyle. But I think this place, I feel there's like a bit of a structure that doesn't allow me to freestyle too much. Um, yeah, or just I can just leave it like this and uh, move on to the the Q and A. I think that works. Yeah, so big round of applause. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's when you do live demo things, which people can join in. This will happen at Congress. People will join in. They will find your code, they'll copy, they'll play around with it. They still have to learn. Yeah, there's a lot of errors. Um, <laughs> so now you have the chance to ask a question. Uh, we still have a bit of time. If you want to ask a question, please line up at the microphones. We have three of them, so you have the, right, the choice. And we have somebody at mic one. Please start. Well, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really inspiring. Um, a very small question, and that is, uh, how does that whole thing relate to the demo scene? Is there like, is that like the uh, 2019 version of the 80s demo scene, or is that something completely new, or, you know? Oh, uh, like this live coding thing. Or the, like, the live coding as well as kind of the combination of visual uh, coding and uh, sound and all these things. Yeah, I mean, this is nothing new. Like, people are doing this, like, um, quite, like, this has, like, really long history, and I think I really have to learn it. Um, but I think it's just, oh, it's really blank. Uh, we just have to, like, keep reinventing because, uh, at, like, as soon as it, like, there's, like, a saturation, like, this is right now it's really nice, but maybe after ten years, like only me and Olivia is like just doing this or something like that. And then we become kind of guru and it became becomes like really hard for other people to join this uh community, for example. And I think it's we have to like keep like rebuilding and also uh noticing what's who's in the community and um yeah, like it has to like this metabolism or uh, yes, has to keep the community really um, healthy, which is, I think, really interesting and important. I don't know if that answers, but uh, that's that's what I think about this P5 JS or processing, uh, like processing community day or this live coding scene that is really interesting about, and it's not only about the aesthetics or uh, the audiovisual thing. Okay, question from mic number two. Yes. Um, did you ever try to um, work with translation from dance notations, like the Laban uh, square notations, and put them in, back into code, into these live coding environments, and then somehow create a feedback loop between this and maybe actual physical movement? Um, not specifically with uh, Laban notation, but I think that's really interesting uh, idea. But um, I always like a bit. I'm always a bit careful about doing this feedback loop because, uh, as a concept, it's really interesting, like adding different things. But as soon as it gets really like so many components, and you don't know what's affecting what, it's just become chaotic and. Sometimes I just, then I, I was doing like machine learning to understand movement and how to really do visual and these things I've tried a bit. But then I started to think that uh, my brain is more interesting than machine learning. So why not just think about take one movement or take uh, sh a shape and relate it to something else. And also I have a new project, uh, upcoming uh, web residency. So I'm going to reside in on web um, to create an uh, online archive. So it's continuation of my archive, but making a bit more, uh, make, thinking about curating and doing uh, exhibition of my work online, and then maybe do another exhibition of exhibition, or exhibition of exhibition of exhibition, and breaking this uh, current uh, 
politics around uh, galleries, museums, and how people sell artworks uh, like physical in a physical way. Sorry, I think it went some, somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, we have a question from the internet. Please. Is this working? Okay. Um, what do you think is the easiest way to get started and getting ideas for programming something graphical with processing? Um, I think that's a really interesting question that... Um, yes, uh, for me, I, I, I think I'm not a good example because I studied engineering and I already knew how to code. But it, it, I think it depends on like the level. Like uh, if you know already know programming, then it's easy to just look at examples on uh, processing. Like if you download processing, you can uh, it comes with examples, like a bunch of nice examples, and uh, you can mix them, play with them, and to understand what's what you can do. Uh, but if you're new to uh, programming, there's really amazing YouTube channel called The Coding Train by Daniel Schiffman, and I recommend you to watch this YouTube channel. Microphone number one. Thanks for the cool talk and the cool um, tools that you introduced. I was playing around with Hydra when you um, told us, so I missed the rest of the talk. But um, <laughs> I have uh, a, a, quite a stupid question. When you 3D printed your brain, what color did you choose? That's um, super important, actually, um, because I didn't really choose the color because I was uh, working at the university and I just uh, sent the STL, uh, no, the uh, G code to whatever available uh, 3D printer, and it was uh, light blue. And it turned out that uh, I recently I do my nails, and that's light blue, and uh, I like this color now, and. I also like my brain, <laughs> and my printed brain. We have one more question from the internet. Did you manage to find other autistic people with similar interests through your art? Sorry, can you say it again? Did you manage to find other people on the autism spectrum with similar interests? Through okay. your art? Um, yes. Um, I think this was really important for me because at first when I noticed that I'm autistic, I was really discouraged. Like, maybe I shouldn't do art because I'm good at programming, but maybe this art thing is not, uh, art is not my thing. Um, but I met an artist who um, is working with brutal movements and the autistic brutal movements, I, which I don't really understand, but she's really like positively um, analyzing, understanding um, the neurodiversity, and uh, which I still don't know how she's managing to relate these art and neurodiversity. But um, I learned that it's possible. Like it's not, yeah, it, it's possible. So um, at first I was really having difficult, uh, like, hard time, like, how to relate it. Like, first I was, like, interested in, uh, interested in EEG, like, brain waves, and somehow relate this because it's uh, brain signals, and I can do media art, like, controlled with brain waves, and blah, blah, blah. And then at one point I thought, okay, I should just do meditation and think about shapes and movements. And this is, like, already interesting way of connecting this neurodiversity and art or digital art. So yes, like I, it's not there are not many um, artists, but um, for example, Erin uh, Manning, uh, she's uh, teaching in Concordia University in uh, Montreal. She's uh, sh her books are, um, yeah, like describing about uh, art and autism, and I highly recommend her books. Okay, I have a question for myself. <laughs> That's a nice thing. I have also a chance to get a question out. Um, have you thought about doing something like this as an art installation at Congress? So that with like a short introduction or something that people can play around you in Congress. I mean, we have a lot of art installations which are programmable in a way, and people love them. So, um, Yes. 
sorry, it, I, it was not refreshing, so I restarted it. Um, yes, like I, I'd love to do it, and please invite me. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, like right now, like my portfolio is really scattered, and uh, it doesn't. I don't. I honestly don't know what I'm doing. But uh, yeah, this this is uh, what I made before, so it's not. This person's creation, this is my quote. Anyways. <laughs> no, no, but this is actually the important part, like remixing something, someone else's quote and uh, doing something else. Sorry. Uh, going back to the question, uh, yes, I, I would love to do something. This, this year, like, I was, uh, it, it's first time here, and uh, actually, it was really, like, short notice. Like, yesterday, I was asked to give a talk. So, um, yeah, I, I was not really... Um, prepared, but, uh, or maybe like tomorrow, maybe I can show something somewhere. Um, yeah, like maybe it's possible. Everything is possible. <laughs> and we have another question at microphone number two. Yeah, well, during your talk, um, uh, yeah, I saw that you have a lot of interest in dance movement and in creating these uh, really weird visuals. I came up with the thought of um, how would it be to combine those both skills with a green screen, which weatherman use when, you know, you know it. How would that be? If you could block yourself out, or if someone else could, well, if you wear green, you could do an interactive programming and just green appears on the screen and you're away, or oh yeah, I mean you're blocked out, or you're, you're yes. on the screen. Um. Just an idea. My brain came up with that. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think I've done something similar, but it was not... It, it was, we didn't have enough time to uh, explore it, but uh, I, I'd love to... Not this link. I'd love to work on it, because I think I want to work more on the physicality of... Uh, and... Oh. What? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I want to like work with like uh, physicality and also about digital thing. Like, I think this is the, what you said. Uh, exactly. It's not yes. myself, yes. but uh, I, uh, I was working with a dancer, and uh, uh, yeah, like he was wearing something green and hiding inside the digital world. Um, yeah, I think there's like so many. Ways I would say the next thing I really want to do is with my nails. Um, I want to really ha I really want to have like a generative pattern nails, but I don't know how. Like what technology I need, I really don't know. Like I mean technology, okay. Like I just need a small display or something, but that's that's not the point, and I have to have to think about it. Well, thank you. <laughs> but thanks for the suggestion. We have another question. Microphone number one. Thank you, and thank you for your talk. I was just interested, uh, I mean, you mentioned Puto and you talked about live coding, and uh, I would really appreciate if you could think about like how you would m draw a connection between Puto as a form of dance and live coding. There's actually uh, another artist, uh, Joanna Chikau. She is working exactly on Buto movement. Uh, well, like she studied Buto and she mm. performs with her body and also live coding. And uh, this one also, I really don't know much about the concept, but uh, there are people working on it. And uh, um, maybe one day I'm also interested in working in this topic. But Buto itself is like, I. Kind of, I'm afraid to uh, touch this topic because uh, it seems like I have to study a lot about Buto, like about the history and uh, yeah, like who's doing what and uh, how I interpret Buto because like I think there are too many artists who don't really know much about Buto but they pretend that they know Buto and uh, I think the real Buto dancers are kind of uh, tired of this. So, but, but I'm really interested in the idea of Buto, like for example, like. Imagining like a fish inside the body and move it, move with it, like but, which is actually kind of related to the meditation idea that I had, that to sh think about the shape and uh, visualize it, but not always with my movement. Okay, thank you very much. We are running out of time, so we have to end this here. 
But thanks for your talk, thanks for these amazing impressions. I hope we'll see more from your art uh, at Congress perhaps this time or next time. There's always a next time. And um, so, also thanks for answering patiently all the questions. And please, another big round of applause for Naoto.